worth its price when it flowed down from the cross my sins were gone my sins forgot there is a
singing that one. Um, you know, from time to time, Pastor, asked, uh, Pastor Jeff or I uh, to give thanks for the offering. You know, and it's, it's not something that we try and, and beat everyone up for and have you given your offering? Oh, okay, you're not a good Christian. That's not something that we do. Um, but when we talk about giving thanks for the offering, you know, we talk about uh, the blessing that we get sometimes as well. You know, and it's not that God needs my money. Uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, as Paul was, was uh, in the city and walking and seeing all these, these altars to all these other gods and all the sacrificing that they would have been doing and all the different temples and all the rest. In Acts 17, verse 23, the Bible says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. You know, if, if this building burnt down, God could still meet with us. God would still meet with us. You know, we, when we do different activities and we do connect nights and all the different places that we would meet or gather, God meets with us. God doesn't need our building to meet with us. We don't need our building to meet with him. And Paul says, God, uh, seeing that the Lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth anything. God doesn't need us. God doesn't need my money. God doesn't need your money. But God allows us to take part. In the book of Proverbs, we find that uh, Solomon was writing to his son. And he said in Proverbs 3 verse 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance. And with the first fruits of all thine increase. That's what I get to take part in. As part of my worship, as part of, of honoring and part of giving back to him, I get the benefit. You know? And, uh, and so that's what we, we want to encourage as we, as we think about giving thanks for our offering and, and try and encourage us as a church family. It, it's not, it's not a, a, a drive for more money. It's an encouragement for you to receive the blessing of the Lord, for you to honor and to be able to worship together with us. As we go to, uh, to the Lord in prayer, there's a couple of prayer requests we should mention. Uh, Harold Lipsky had a fall, um, and I believe broke a couple of ribs. Is that, is that right? I think so. He thinks they're broken. He thinks, yeah. And so if we remember uh, Brother Harold, um, and just, uh, just the praying that the Lord would, would uh, strengthen his body quickly. Uh, I talked with Carla this morning, and she said Daniel was, was, had a pretty good morning so far. Uh, and so he is uh, recovering and, and getting stronger from the transplant that he had, but still needs our prayer. You know, these next couple weeks, um, he has no immune system. And so it's a, it's a dangerous time, it really is. And so our prayer is that uh, he would recover quickly and that uh, also there'd be no infection that would come up. Uh, Matt Pankers we're praying for. I believe he has some more tests this week. Uh, and just praying just for peace in that family. I know it's, it's, a waiting, it's a waiting thing. And you're just waiting for a phone call with, the, with some news. And, and so I remember Matt and uh, Jocelyn and Lil Paisley as well. 
Uh, Ronan, uh, is, as many of you saw, um, slipped out of the service this morning, just really not well. Um, they are home tonight, and uh, they're going to give the doctors a call tomorrow. Um, and it's good having Joanne around, wherever she is. I think she's somewhere. Oh, hi. Good having Joanne here. I know she's getting stronger, uh, um, just recovering from the radiation um, and uh, the treatment that they had, or she had. And, and we're just praising the Lord that she's able to be at church and that uh, the Lord's um, just continuing to, to heal her body. And so many things to, to thank the Lord for, but also to, to um, some prayer requests. And so let's, let's join together as we pray. Lord, we do love you. God, we do thank you that um, we have an opportunity to bring offerings before you, God. Not that they're demanded, not that they're... Um, uh, th it's an opportunity for us to worship. God, I pray that we would seize that opportunity and that we take advantage of the blessings there. God, we do pray for these needs tonight. We pray for Brother Harold, and, um, that you'd um, just help him to heal up quickly if, if these ribs have been broken, that, um, that they would not take long or they would not be uncomfortable for long. God, we do pray that you'd continue blessing Daniel and Carla and just give them peace and give uh, his body strength. God, we ask that there'd be no infections in these coming weeks. Um, God, that he would just have a smooth recovery. We do pray for Matt as they, they wait for tests and wait for results, that you just calm his heart, give him peace, give Jocelyn peace as well, and know for Paisley as well as they're awaiting tests and just and just waiting, God. And it's just such a hard time, and I pray that you'd give them your peace. And we do pray for Ronan at this hour as well, that you just um, be with her, and I know the doctors are, are doing investigations, trying to find out what's going on. I pray that you'd give them uh, wisdom. God, we also thank you for the, the progress Joanne has seen and, and the strength that you've given her and, and the opportunity that she can worship with us. And we thank you and we praise you for that. God, we just ask for your presence this evening. God, we ask that you uh, would speak to our hearts as your word is opened, um, that the Holy Spirit would, would uh, convict us, God, if, if there's something that we need to change. God, that we'd have no doubt and no question about that, that we'd have the courage to do so. God, if we need encouragement, I pray the Holy Spirit would, would provide that, that joy, that peace that we need. God, just meet with us tonight. We, we need your presence and we ask for it. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Listen as our, our group sings, Not Guilty. You know, and you think about our, our status before the Lord. We talked about that this morning, him taking our place. And uh, one of the things that we get is justification, just as if I never sinned. You know, and when we come to Jesus and we're forgiven, this is the song that you can sing, Not Guilty. I stand accused There's a list of my I'm so ashamed There's nowhere left for me to hide This is the day I must answer for my life
We get to stand together as a church family and we're going to sing and worship the Lord. It is well with my soul. You know, could you sing that without Jesus? Could you sing that if you were still guilty? If you still had to pay the price for your sin? Think about that this evening. You are free, you are guiltless, and it is well with your soul. Let's sing together. Think about that as we sing this third verse. Let's sing it.
What a great song. We'll also sing My Sins Are Gone. Choir, you are dismissed. Thank you. My Sins Are Gone. sing amazing grace my chains are gone thinking about the grace of our lord to save us
we've had a good day of worship. We really have. And I, I just feel like we could go home right now and just feel blessed. And I left the service this morning and just felt almost overwhelmed with the goodness of God. It was a good day. And praise the Lord for it. And, uh, you know, I, 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 love, I love preaching, but I love what I learn when I'm studying and getting ready to preach. And it just blesses my heart, too. Turn, if you will, tonight to Luke chapter 10. If you'll do that, Luke chapter 10. And we're not going to be real long tonight. And I know we have a fellowship to follow. And I hope that you can stay and be a part of that. And we're just taking donations tonight. Uh, we appreciate the Foundations class is sponsoring this, uh, this fundraiser tonight. And so they're having Cheesecake Night. And uh, Brother Leroy, I want you to know, because I picked on you, four people brought pies and one bought a piece of cake just for you. So I'll pick on you more if that helps. How's that sound? And uh, well, amen. Appreciate, appreciate folks taking care of Brother Leroy. And uh, I, I remember, I remember, Brother Leroy, we were going to the Bill Rice Ranch one year. And we were walking, you and I were walking together into the lunch hall. I don't know if you remember this. And you stopped in your tracks and you started going the other way. And I said, where are you going? You go, there's cheese in there. And we walked in and we were having cheeseburgs. You could smell it outside. Do you remember that? (laughs) Poor fella. I mean, what a thing to be allergic to or to hate. I don't know. Luke chapter 10 tonight. Luke chapter 10. Are you glad you're saved? Amen. Amen. We've had a great weekend a lot of great preaching. We, uh, yesterday and Friday, it was a great weekend. And uh, all those videos are posted online. Now you can go to our, our church webpage or you can go to the YouTube page, uh, Facebook, I guess, all those places. If you go to YouTube or the church page, they're all archived in a, in a playlist there and you can find them all very easily. And uh, it'll be a blessing to you. Share those with somebody. Share, share them with somebody that couldn't come, maybe, or send them to a friend. And uh, we've got some feedback. I, I've, we've had people in British Columbia watching already, and, and I've got emails from different people all around the country that are watching those, those Man Up videos and, and excited about it. And so uh, asking that maybe they could do something like that in their province. And so be in prayer about that. We need revival in Canada. And uh, we, need, we need men to be revived, that's for sure. All right. Luke chapter 10. This is probably... One of the most familiar passages of Scripture, and I, we say that, but shouldn't all the Bible be familiar to us if we're people of the book? It really should be. And, uh, but then we get into, my wife and I, we've been reading through, and we, we just finished the book of Joshua, and we're getting into Judges. And you know, uh, those last few chapters of Joshua, they're dividing up the land. And so most days, I like to read, and then there's some days where she'll want to read, and, uh, but the last, the last few chapters, it's been, no, you read. Because it's all those cities and towns that nobody can pronounce. And so we got to kind of get a kick out of each other trying to pronounce those words. And, and uh, so we may not be as familiar with some parts of the Bible. And uh, there was literally one city, I counted the letters, 17 letters long. And we got to the point, honestly, and, I, and we weren't trying to be goofy or silly or anything. we just say, that city. Because we could not figure out how to pronounce that thing. And so there are some parts of scriptures that are not, that are not as familiar, but this one certainly is. Luke chapter 10. I want to show you tonight, just, just quickly for a few moments, what the Lord showed me about this passage. And um, I don't want you to put the title up just yet, Brother Judge, if you could keep that down just for a moment. Because I, I, I don't want you to get ahead of me in our, in our notes tonight. But there's a word here. This is the story, of course, of Mary and Martha. And uh, there's a lot about Mary and Martha, really. We see about the death of their brother Lazarus, don't we? And Martha ran to Jesus, and she was frantic and hurried, but Mary just waited quietly at home until the Lord called upon her. And we see that relationship develop throughout the Scriptures, but now we come to the point where the Lord Jesus Christ is visiting in their home. And the Bible says that Mary sat at Jesus' feet... But Martha was cumbered about with much serving. That word cumbered right there in the Bible is the only time it appears in the entire scriptures. But I want to show you what it means tonight. I think sometimes we change the meaning in our mind because it doesn't fit just the way we think it should fit. And and I think as I explain what I mean by that tonight, you'll probably understand and maybe even agree with me. So look, if you will, in Luke chapter 19 and and jump all the way down to verse 38. We're just going to read the last five verses, Luke chapter 19, or sorry, Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. I don't know where I got 19 from. Please forgive me if I say that again. You ever get something stuck in your head and you just keep saying it? 
You ever preached on Moses and said Abraham over and over or Noah over and over again? I've done that. And I just get to the point where I say, listen, if I say no, I mean Moses, okay? Luke chapter 10, look at verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went, Jesus entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, I know Brother Calvin has prayed for many tonight, but we don't want to forget Brother Patterson as well, and so we lift him up before you. And Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, that he got to the hospital and doing a little better today. And Lord has a treatment and a procedure this week, and I pray, Lord, that it would take care of his problems. Lord, that you would help him, Lord, give him health and strength back. And Thank you, Lord. That, the, the Patterson family has been such a blessing to our church and a blessing to me. And so, Lord, I pray that you bless them in return, and may we be a blessing to them. Father, bless our time in the Word. Now, for the next few moments, would you commit our hearts to Scripture? Lord, may the Spirit of God help me. I need your help, and I surrender to you. And I pray, Lord, that following our fellowship would be sweet. I pray we'd have a good time together. And, Lord, that uh, we would honor you in our, in our conversation and in all the things that we talk about. Lord, may we bring you glory. And Lord, we'll thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask all of this, amen. Look if you get, would again at the scriptures tonight in Luke chapter 10. And if you'll direct your attention to verse 40, the Bible says, but Martha was cumbered about much serving. Now, you've probably used that word cumbered or encumbered. We use that in the English language today, and it literally means, I I looked it up to make sure it meant what I thought it meant, it meant a hindrance. That's what it means. If you're cumbered in some way, there's some blockade or something that is hindering you from making forward progress, and that's what the word cumbered means. Sometimes we say encumbered because we we have maybe an injury or something that encumbers us, and so it slows us down a little bit, And, and you say, I wish I could just get rid of this encumbrance. And we may not use the word much anymore, but if, if I say it enough times, you understand, or you say, I, I've heard that before. Maybe it's somebody from a different generation, but I've heard that word before, and I understand what it means. It's, it's something that hinders us or keeps us from doing what we want to do or hinders us from forward progress. And the Bible says that Martha was cumbered about with much serving. We look at that word and we say, What was hindering Martha? Mary went and sat at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Bible says that Martha was cumbered from doing so. I begin to wonder, that's an odd way to use that word. The word cumbered, I I would think that in the house that they lived in was probably not very big. I don't imagine they were rich people. They were under Roman oppression. And so I I believe they likely had a modest home and maybe they had a bedroom in the back for Lazarus and another one for Mary and Martha, the the three siblings, and maybe a little sitting area and a kitchen or maybe it was all kind of an open concept. And I'm not sure how it laid out, but there wasn't much between Martha and the Lord. As a matter of fact, when this was taking place, Martha was aware it was taking place. They weren't in a back room somewhere hiding away and whispering in the dark. And instead it was out in the open and Martha became increasingly bothered. So to say that she was cumbered, there really wasn't much stopping her from going and sitting at the feet of Jesus, was there? There was no physical ailment that was holding her back. There was nothing, a barrier of any sort between her and them. There are times I remember in the scripture that there was a a man who was sick of the palsy and four of his friends wanted to get him to Jesus, but they were cumbered. 
The Bible talks about the masses that surrounded that little house. And so the men uh, beat through their way through that cumbrance, didn't they? They climbed upon the roof and they removed the tiles and they lowered the man through. And though they were cumbered, they found some way to get to Jesus. But Martha had no such cumbrance in her life. Sometimes the masses would keep people from Jesus. We're reminded of the woman with the issue of blood who had to push her way through the crowd and just get a hold of the hem of his garment that by faith she might be healed. There was such a press at times where the Lord had to actually leave the city because of the multitudes that want to see him. How, do you, how many of you know that sometimes the disciples were a cumbrance? Blind Bartimaeus would cry from the wayside and they would try to silence him. And Bartimaeus just cried all the louder. There were little children that by their parents were brought to the Lord Jesus Christ and the disciples tried to keep them away from the Savior and he said, no, no, suffer the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of God. The disciples were sometimes a hindrance or got in the way of people getting to Jesus. If we read the scriptures, we find all kinds of things that were a hindrance to getting people to Jesus but Martha really didn't have any excuses. As a matter of fact, Jesus came to her home, sat with Mary and Lazarus and her, an audience of three, and she could have very easily went and sat at the feet of Jesus. But the Bible said she was cumbered, hindered. So sometimes in our minds, we change that word, don't we? We may not change the word, but we sometimes change the meaning of the word. We say, well, it means burdened. She was cumbered about, uh, cumbered about with much uh, serving. What it really means is she was burdened by all this serving. She was busy. Do you know burden was around in the time they wrote the Bible? If they wanted to say burden, they would have said burdened. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy, what? Burdened. They know that word. If they meant burden, they would have said burden. And we change it in our mind. I mean, well, she was burdened. She was heavy laden. She was busy about the Lord's work. But that's not what they said. They said she was cumbered. She was hindered. So I began to dig a little deeper. And I looked up the word cumbered in the Greek. The Greek word that cumbered comes from, listen to this, literally means to be distracted. We would not substitute the word burden there, but we might substitute the word distracted. She was distracted by her serving. So in other words, what cumbered Martha was not some physical obstacle and not the obstacle of distance or weather or health or some other inability, not the cost of travel, not the hindrance of the crowds or the distract, but rather it was simply the distractions of life. Let me say it this way. Martha's cumbrance was because she chose to be distracted. The title of my message tonight is just simply Distractions. Distractions. If we're being honest, if we're being honest, the thing that keeps us from sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ the most are those things that we choose and those things that we allow to distract us. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? I gotta be honest, I was getting a little worried about the weather this weekend. I was, I was watching the weather forecast. We were supposed to Friday night to Saturday. We were supposed to, on, on Friday morning, we got snow from 9 a.m. till noon. And, and they said half centimeter per hour, but I think we got about two or three centimeters an hour. We got enough to plow the lot. But then, from about 7 o'clock at night till midnight, we were supposed to get 10 centimeters. I thought, well, that's no big deal. I live seven minutes from here, but guys coming from Toronto and folks coming from Barrie and people coming from all over, and Calvin had already bought 108 pizzas, and they were paid for. They were coming whether we had people or not. We had potato chips. We had supplies. We, I mean, I bought 400 coffee cups just for those two days. Incredible, the supplies we went through. 
And I was getting a little concerned and said, Lord, what's going on? I don't know if you watched the radar. It was an amazing thing. The storm, literally half of it went over Lake Erie and half of it went Bramford and above and just split right around us. Just like that. And we were right, I looked at the blue dot in the middle where Simcoe is and it was just clear. We didn't get any more snow that night. The Lord just blessed us. But there were some folks that called me that day. They said, Pastor, we're not going to make it. We're hindered by the weather. We're cumbered by the weather. Sometimes that's genuine, right? Sometimes we are, oh, we're snowed in or, or something goes, sometimes, sometimes it's our health or an illness comes up and, and just sometimes out of consideration, we don't want to hand that off to everybody in the church and so we're, we're cumbered by some genuine things but let's just be honest, a lot of times we are hindered from getting to the feet of Jesus because we put our own distractions in our lives. We choose to be busy with other things that don't matter. I remember years ago inviting a lady to our home after church on a Sunday morning and her and a couple other ladies, and I, I, we said, would you guys like to come over for lunch on Sunday? And they, they said, yeah, we'd like that, we'd like that, we'd like that. They all answered the same, and, and we got to the one lady, and she says, well, I'll come on one condition. I thought, oh, great, she wants steak or something, you know. <laughs> she said this. She says, I don't want you to cook. She says, just make a sandwich. She says, because when we come over, we want a fellowship, and she says, if you're in there doing dishes and cooking and, and doing all that work, she says, we don't get to fellowship. A sandwich is fine. A slice of cheese and a pickle, we're good. She says, then we can just sit and fellowship. And if you have paper plates, even better. Don't get it all fancy. We want to visit. Sometimes we're so busy with all the ornaments. We forget about sitting at the feet of Jesus and fellowshipping. I want you to notice tonight some things we pull from this passage. The d number one is this, the dangers of distractions. The dangers of distractions. The dangers. You say there's danger? Oh, absolutely, there's dangers. Look, look what the passage says tonight. I, I want you to notice as we read it again, it says in verse 38, now it came to pass as they went that they entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house and she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But let me paraphrase the next verse. But Martha was somewhere else. That's not what it says, but that's what it's saying. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, but Martha wasn't. And so what are some of the dangers of distractions? Number one, not lingering in Christ's presence. How many times have you said, well, I'll read my Bible as soon as I get the dishes done. I'll get the kids to bed, I'll vacuum the floors, I'll do the laundry, I'll do all the work that needs to be done, and then at the end of the day, I will spend some time with the Lord, and you're so tired, you fall into bed. And your day is over, and you say, well, I'll try again tomorrow. The dangers of distractions is not lingering Christ's presence. I, I don't know if Mary was hungry or not, maybe she was. I, I, if, she's, if she were Baptist, I guarantee she's hungry. And we all like to have a good meal, don't we? But Mary said, if Jesus is coming to my house, I'm going to spend some time with him. I'm going to linger in his presence. And so the dangers of distraction, number one tonight, is not lingering in Christ's presence. But number two, not learning Christ's precepts. Notice what the scripture says. The Bible says, and she had a sister called Mary, which sat at Jesus' feet. And look what it says next. And heard his word. And heard his word. I don't know what Martha heard, but she didn't hear his word. The Bible says Mary did. Martha wasn't there. I don't know how far away she was, but here's what Martha was hearing. Can you believe that your sister's in there doing nothing while you're working? Martha was hearing the, the words of the devil fueling her bitterness. But had she been, how many of you know if she'd been sitting at the feet of Jesus hearing his words, she wouldn't have got bitter? Christ would have strengthened her. So the dangers of distraction are, are twofold so far. First, not lingering in the Christ's presence. And number two, not learning Christ's presence precepts. Number three, listen to this, not loving Christ personally. I believe Martha loved Christ. There's no doubt about it. 
I believe that she loved Christ so much she wanted to impress him with her service. She wanted to put out the best meal that she could prepare. She wanted to do something that would be a blessing to Christ. And Yes, she loved him, but listen, let me tell you this. There's nothing better than sitting at his feet, looking him in the eye, listening to his words, and worshiping him and telling him you love him. I'll tell you this. I love... Love, love, love. And almost every day, I get a picture of my grandkids. I got a picture of Bowden this afternoon. And that kid, I, it was a little video actually. I don't know what he was eating. But when he took a bite of that thing, he looked like he had robbed a bank or something. He was so, ah. Oh. He just, I mean, he lit up. I love getting that stuff. Let me tell you, it's no substitute for being in person. Not even close. We, we, every, every single morning at 7.30 before we leave the house, we, my wife and I at 7 o'clock, we'll get together and we'll read our Bible and we'll pray together. And at 7.30, Lord willing, our, our FaceTime goes off and there's Theo. Man, I love that. And he's got to the age now where mom can't hold the phone. He wants that. And if she says, got my phone, he goes the other way. He's walking and he's smiling at us and looking at us. And he wants to hold that phone and talk to grandma and grandpa. I love it. But I love it a whole lot more when he's with me. I love it when he's at our house. My wife and I, the only time we ever fight is, hey, can I go get Theo up? No, I'm getting Theo. And we, who's going to get the baby, you know? It's not the same as loving them personally. We could send a gift in the mail. We've had to do that. You order something and send it over to them. It's not the same as being there and handing it to them and saying, we love you. Martha missed out on loving Christ personally. Hey, that's the danger of being distracted, friend. We, we live in a world full of distractions, don't we? We live in a world that cumbers us and hinders us from getting to the feet of Christ and, and, uh, and lingering in Christ's presence and, and le learning Christ's precepts and loving Christ personally. That's the danger of distraction. But let me show you the second thing we see in this passage, the discouragement of distractions. The discouragement. Notice verse 40 with me. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Here's the number one discouragement of distractions, the feelings of abandonment. The feelings of abandonment. Let me tell you this, you can be in a room with a thousand people and if you don't know Christ, you'll feel all alone. There are people today walking through this world discouraged and downhearted each and every day. They go to a workplace full of people. They get on a bus full of people. They go home to a house full of people. They're around people all the time and they feel all alone because they don't spend time with Christ. Do you know why? Because the, uh, the Bible says this, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And all the people in the world combined aren't even close to who is living within you. And so we must spend time with him. And so the discouragement of being distracted is that feeling of being all alone. She says, Lord, I feel all alone. Hey, all she had to do was step in the presence of Christ. I'm left to serve alone. The feeling of abandonment, but also we see the feelings of anxiety. Martha identified herself that she was all by herself. She's off in the kitchen left to serve alone. But notice what Jesus says about her in verse 41. And Jesus answers unto her, Martha, Martha, look at these two things. Thou art careful and troubled about many things. Martha, you're careful or you're full of care and you're troubled. You see, when we get caught up in all the distractions of this world and we don't spend time with Christ, that's what happens in our lives. We become full of care and we become troubled. Uh, we, we call it anxious or anxiety. And we see that Martha was no stranger to that. Though she knew Christ personally, because she didn't spend time with Christ uh, intimately and sat at his feet and learned of his word, she had these feelings of abandonment and anxiety. 
But let me give you one more thing tonight, and I think this is where we need to grab on. Notice the deliverance, the deliverance from distractions. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us how in verse 42. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Let me give you three words tonight that will help us be delivered from distractions. Number one is this, determine. Determine. Now, because of alliteration, I'm using the word determine, but it's choose. We have to determine in our hearts who we're going to serve. Isn't that what Joshua did? At the end of Joshua's life, he, I'll paraphrase tonight, he said, whether it seemed good unto you, uh, whether you serve the gods of the Amorites or the gods on the other side of the river, he says, but you choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He determined in his heart that he would lead his family into serving the Lord. And that's the first step. Notice, notice what the Lord Jesus Christ says about that. He, he says in verse 42, but one thing is need, needful, and Mar Mary hath chosen. She's chosen the good part. She has chosen something that will never be taken away from her. She has chosen to sit at the feet of Jesus. She has chosen to serve the Lord. Amen. She's chosen not to be distracted. Mary could have gotten up and helped with the meal, and she could have done some other things, maybe to serve the Lord. Maybe she could have washed his feet or anointed him with oil. She could have done a lot of things that might have been a blessing to the Lord. She might have said, Lord, let me go prepare a little chamber for you so you can rest and, and stay the night. Let me, let me go wash your clothes for you. You've been traveling, and the roads are dusty. There's a million things she could have done, but instead she said, no, I'm not going to miss this chance. I want to tell him I love him by sitting at his feet. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Martha, Mary hath chosen the good part. Mary hath chosen what's right. Let me ask you, what have you determined in your life? It takes a conscious choice. Look at the second word. The second word is discipline. Discipline. Notice verse 42. How many things were needful? One thing, but one thing is needful. I don't want to add to the scripture, but if I could paraphrase Lord Jesus Christ, I might say it this way. Martha, lots of things are a blessing, but only one thing is needful. <laughs> I'm sure that meal will be good, Martha, but right now the most important thing would be hear these words. Sit at my feet. Can, can I tell you this, do you know why Jesus went to that house in the first place? Because those were some of the dearest people on earth to him, and he loved them, and he wanted to see them. That's why. He just wanted to spend time with them. And Martha said, maybe later, I've got work to do. We need to determine in our lives that we're going to have discipline. And the discipline is this, we have to realize what is needful. And Jesus said one thing is needful. This is, this, listen, just as is, is, is necessary to have oxygen to live a physical life, you need Christ to live a spiritual life. He said, how do you know that? Because he said he is the bread of life and he is the water of life. He is the living water. Go, how, how long can you go without water? Six, seven days and then you'll die. Without the living water. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you take this water, you'll never thirst again. We need Christ. So we need to be deter uh, make a determination. We have to be determined in our lives that we're going to be disciplined. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. Listen to this. He said, well, I don't have time. You should understand how busy I am. A lot of your busyness is because you've chosen to be distracted. But listen to what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. To everything there is a season, and listen, and a time to every purpose under heaven. Are you commanded to pray? Yes. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yes. Are you commanded to read your Bible? Yes. Hey, somebody else knew that one. Good. Amen. Has God purposed it in your life? Yes. 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 Well, then the Bible says there's a time for every purpose under heaven. 
To say you don't have time is to call God a liar. Well, that convicted me when I thought of that. If God has purposed it in your life, well, I don't have time to go to church. But the Bible says not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. God has desired for us. Christ is the head of the church. He's that preeminence in the church. Christ died for the church. And yet we say, well, I don't have time for it. No, there's a time for every purpose under heaven. You make time for everything else. So you have to deliberately determine to have this discipline. There's one thing that is needful, that we spend time with Christ. And then there's a third word I want to give you. It's, it's the word direction. The word direction. What direction will you go? What will you choose? Turn, if you will, to Psalm chapter 1. We're, we're almost done. Psalm chapter 1. There's a three-part to this verse I want you to see. I had never, never in my life read this verse like this before. Psalm chapter one, you all know the verse. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. I'll just stop there for a moment. Pick out the three verbs. I, I, I get scared when I say stuff like that because my English teacher's sitting right there. Pick out the three verbs. Blesses the man that what? Walketh. Walketh not. What's the next one? Standeth or sitteth. I never looked at this this way before. This is a progression. For a while you're walking, and then you stand, and then you sit. Notice what the scripture is saying to us. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Here's the question that comes from that first phrase. Number one, what is leading you? What is leading you? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. In other words, there are those that are walking in the counsel of the ungodly. They're, they're being led by that false counsel, and they're being led by ungodly people and the wickedness of this world, and they're drawn to it, so they're walking in that direction. And now look what it says next. Nor standeth where? In the way of sinners. Here's the progression. They're walking along, and they're being led by that wickedness, and they're being led closer. Listen, it's almost like Lot pitching his tent towards Sodom. At some point, Lot stopped, and here's, here's what that word standeth means. Where will you linger? The word stand, if you look it up in the Hebrew, it literally means to stop and take notice. In other words, you're being led in that direction, and sin is driving you forward, and your eye is, is drawing you towards the bright lights in that city of Sodom and that place of sin, and as you walk, you stop and you linger for but a moment, and you go, oh, that's what it means to stand in the way of sinners. But look what the guy does next. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The third question we have to ask is this, where are you landing? What is leading you? Where are you lingering? But where are you landing? Where is this taking you? Where are you ending up? The Lord Jesus Christ said to Martha, Martha, one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part. She wasn't walking after the counsel of the ungodly. She wasn't standing in the way of sinners. She wasn't sitting in the seat of the scornful. But instead, she was following the Savior. And she was lingering in his presence. And she was sitting at his feet. Psalm chapter 1, verse 2. Notice what it says. This could describe Mary. 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his law doth he meditate day and night. Mary chose the best part to sit at his feet and to hear his words. Let me ask you those three questions again quickly tonight. What is leading you? What direction are you going? Are you following after the glitz and the glamour of this world? Listen, let me tell you this. The world will offer you anything to get you to quit following Christ. Where do you linger? What grabs your attention and causes you to pause and where will you land? Are you sitting in the seat of the scornful? Or are you going to choose tonight to be like Mary and sit at the feet of Christ? Well, that takes some determination and some discipline in our lives to avoid the distractions that we create because we allow them to get in the way of our relationship with Christ. Listen what Jesus said. Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. You choose what will distract you. What it is that keeps you from sitting at Christ's feet. I like that, that final admonition from the Lord, it shall, what shall not be taken away from her. How many of you have heard of a rock and roll singer named Buddy Holly? Yeah? Buddy Holly is buried in the same cemetery as my in-laws. He was from Lubbock, Texas. And of course, you probably know the story, he crashed in a plane crash, and so every time we go, we went to my mother-in-law's funeral, we went to my father-in-law's funeral, and we drive right past the grave of Buddy Holly. There's a big sign there, and it says, Buddy Holly's grave, and I'm, I'm looking, as I'm driving through, it's a massive cemetery. As I'm driving through that cemetery, I'm thinking, well, there's, I, I knew Buddy Holly was buried there, I'd heard of him, and... And uh, before my time, but I had heard of him. And I thought there'd be some big monument, you know. But there's a sign. It says, Buddy Holly's grave, as you drive in, and it has an arrow. And it's right there near the entrance. It's not too far in. The reason they do that is because so many people come looking for it. It's a little marker flat on the ground about this big. Now, listen. When I die, bury me in a cornfield. And I don't care about a grave marker or anything. That's not important. But I'm thinking, here's a guy that had all of the glitz and the glamour of the world. Here's a guy that flew in private airplanes wherever he went. Here's a guy that was making millions of dollars when that meant a lot of money. Here's a guy that had fame and fortune and adoring fans and do you know what's on that little grave marker? It just lays flat on the ground. By the way, the fellow that led my father-in-law to the Lord had been at that church so long, he had a part in Buddy Holly's funeral. He was buried out of the, the Temple Baptist Church in Lubbock, Texas. He'd been, back in the 50s, he had a part in his funeral. People come and they put coins on that grave to try to buy his soul out of purgatory. Now, he grew up in that Baptist church. He wasn't a Roman Catholic, but Roman, a lot of Spanish Roman Catholics in that area, and they come and they put money. Uh, isn't that something? Somebody with fame and fortune and millions of dollars, now his fans come and put coins on his grave to try to get his soul out of purgatory. That's what his life has been reduced to. Everything he had is gone. As long as it took for that plane to fall from the sky, in a moment it was gone. But what Mary had on that day, she still has today. Think about that. What Mary received at the feet of Jesus shall not be taken away from her. What is more important to you? What is eternal or what is temporary? Don't let the distractions of this world take what is eternal from you and offer you what is temporary. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Speak to our hearts with it, we pray. We thank you, Lord, 
for the illustration that we see from the life of Jesus Christ in the, in the lives of Mary and Martha and how important it is that we, we tune out the things of this world that we might spend that time with Christ we ought to spend. Lord, speak to our hearts tonight and move among us. Lord, we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand tonight with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Maybe God has spoke to your heart tonight. And can, can I ask you to do this? Would everyone in this room just, just consider for a moment, what is one thing that distracts me from spending more time with Christ, from sitting at his feet? What is that one thing that you could give up or put away for the Lord? What distracts you? The only time we see it in all of Scripture, she was cumbered, and that cumbrance or that hindrance to getting to the Lord was a distraction that she manufactured all by herself. It was a distraction in her mind, a lack of discipline. Would to God that we would search that out in our own lives and give it over to the Lord. Imagine for a moment if the Lord got distracted on the Calvary Road. Imagine for a moment if the Lord got distracted in the service where you heard preaching and didn't bother to convict you with his Holy Spirit and save your soul. Let's be dismissed tonight after a couple of announcements. Let me remind you, this is your last opportunity to be reminded to take some uh, flyers with you. Please take as many as you can. Hand those up. And just walk up your street. It's going to be a nice week, by the way. It's supposed to be sunny and warmer this week. And uh, God's given us that, that we can just go out. If, if everybody took 50 flyers and just walked around the block and did a couple of houses, just stuffed them in their mailbox, you would, uh, you would get 50 out real quick. And it's good exercise too, amen? And so go and, and invite some folks and, and, and allow them to come. Saturday night, 6 o'clock, Sunday morning at 10.30. No Sunday school next week. All right, somebody got that mixed up with today. And so but it's next week, no Sunday school. And uh, Sunday night will be moved to Saturday night. And so we'll have Saturday night and Sunday morning this week instead of two Sunday services. And so uh, you have a couple opportunities to invite people. And like I always say, come, come to both, one to serve and one to enjoy it and be a blast. Uh, but come and serve. And Brother Paul's working on workers to, uh, to, to get those ushers together. And here, here's what I'd like to do. If, if, um, as soon as we dismiss, as soon as we dismiss, if I could have the ushers and greeters hang back for five minutes, I promise you five minutes, okay? I'll get you to your cheesecake. I just want, I just want to go over a couple things. Uh, we have uh, some new visitors packets we want to give out next week. And so I just want to go over that very quickly tonight before we leave. I promise you it'll only be a couple minutes and you can get over to the fellowship, all right? So we're looking forward to a good time at the Cheesecake Fellowship. Do you have any announcements? Okay.